Did you know that after Metroid Prime 3 was finished, one of its developers pitched a game called Metroid Tactics? Or that Next Level Games was building a Metroid game with PS3 level graphics codenamed Project Valkyrie? And years before that, Miyamoto was pushing for Metroid to get a sequel on the Nintendo 64? We talked to some former employees of Retro Studios, Next Level Games, Nintendo, Rareware, and even Rockstar to learn more about all three games, and why they never saw the light of day. There's lots to cover, so we'll jump straight into it with Metroid Tactics, a concept pitched internally at Retro Studios by a member of the Metroid Prime team, Paul Tozer. Did you know Gaming spoke with Paul a few months ago, and he was kind enough to tell us about this piece of Metroid history that before now, no one outside of Retro even knew existed. Metroid Tactics was aimed at the Wii, and Paul wrote up the pitch in late 2007, pretty much immediately after Metroid Prime 3 was finished. As far as the story goes, Tactics would have been a series prequel. According to the pitch document, the events in this game take place long before all other games in the Metroid series. It marks the very moment when Samus Aran first separates from the Chozo who raised her from childhood, encounters humanity, and becomes a bounty hunter. The game also marks humankind's very first encounter with the space pirates and Metroids. Samus must cooperate with an elite team of highly trained Galactic Federation troopers and colorful bounty hunters to stop the incursion on several Galactic Federation planets, at various locations on planets such as Norion and Earth, and eventually take on the space pirates at their outpost on planet Zebus. As for the gameplay, it's basically XCOM, Paul told us. It was XCOM in the Metroid universe, except instead of fighting aliens, you're fighting space pirates, who are also aliens, but different. If you're not familiar with XCOM, it's like a more mature and complex version of Mario and Rabbids gameplay, sort of in the same ballpark as Fire Emblem, Advance Wars, and Final Fantasy Tactics. In XCOM, about half the game is grid-based tactical combat, and the other half is spent at your base hiring and outfitting soldiers, building base expansions like genetics labs and satellite uplinks, having your scientists research new weapons and equipment, and so on. XCOM was a revolutionary PC game back in 1994, then in 2012 got a remake for the PS3, Xbox 360, Vita, PC, mobile, basically every platform that wasn't Nintendo. Maybe because it was rated M? But of course, Retro would have had its own unique spin on the XCOM formula. According to the pitch document, Metroid Tactics allows the player to control the legendary Samus Aran, a squad of elite Galactic Federation troops, and various other bounty hunters as they work together to defeat the space pirates. Along the way, the player can hire new units and upgrade all of the units in his team with many different kinds of new armor, weapons, skills, and abilities, with Samus and the various bounty hunters having a large number of unique abilities that will prove invaluable in combat. Samus is the main character, but you don't really play as Samus. She's just one soldier under the player's command. So, who's the player character? Uh, okay, player takes the role of a Galactic Federation commander, um, even has a name for him I'm not gonna repeat. Pretty stupid name. Um, Paul had grown to dislike the name he came up with 15 years earlier, but he showed it to us eventually. It's Galactic Federation Commander Justin Bailey. That's a reference to the famous password for the original NES Metroid that removed Samus's power suit. Justin Bailey was one of those gaming mysteries that survived for decades, long rumored to be the name of one of the developers or an inside joke, but in reality was just a randomly generated password. As Commander Bailey, you acquire cash by completing missions, and extra cash by accomplishing side objectives like rescuing civilians on the battlefield. Space pirates drop their weapons and other technology after they're killed, which can be sold off for even more cash. Back at the base, you can spend your space bucks to hire Galactic Federation troopers and extremely powerful bounty hunters, who of course are more expensive, and also purchase weapons, armor, various equipment, and skill upgrades. According to the doc, each unit will have abilities specific to that character. For example, Samus will be able to use her Power Beam, Plasma Beam, Nova Beam, which can pass through walls and can damage multiple enemies in sequence, Missile, Ice Missile, which freezes non-boss enemies for several turns, Super Missile, Seeker Missile, Boost Ball, that has fast movement and can damage and knock back enemies, and Power Bombs. The doc goes on to explain how each unit can earn experience through battle, and they'll gain access to new abilities. Like Samus can't use her Seeker Missile ability from the get-go, but will acquire it at a later level. Galactic Federation troopers are the grunts, carrying weapons like pistols, machine guns, sniper rifles, grenades, and recovered space pirate weapons. Leveling up through experience allows them to increase their accuracy, detect enemies at a longer distance, and expand their maximum AP. AP, or action points, are how every character moves and attacks. Every action costs a certain amount of AP. 
For example, a trooper can fire a standard shot for 2 AP, a burst shot for 4, or throw a grenade at the cost of 8 AP. The AP system is illustrated by the pitch document's one and only mock-up screenshot, which shows Samus and a couple of troopers fighting a space pirate and a berserker pirate. At this moment, it's one of the troopers' turns. So far, he spent 7 of his 12 AP, and his options are movement, shooting, taking a crouch stance, and guard mode. During gameplay, all these options are selected with the Wii's pointer controls. The pitch doc says Metroid Tactics uses a control interface similar to mouse-driven turn-based PC game interfaces, but highly customized for the Wii, then lays out details for button functions and so forth. The Berserker's battle is meant to be one of the game's boss fights. Talking more about bosses, the doc says, Metroid Tactics presents a unique opportunity in the scale and scope of the major battles, and the presence of massive boss creatures and challenging boss-like encounters that will demand the utmost of the player's tactical decision-making. Many of the most famous creatures from the Metroid franchise, such as Ridley and the Berserker Pirate, are a natural fit for the massive boss battles that will require the utmost of Samus and her team, and the doc ends with an explanation of why the game should get made. Four points are given, bringing Metroid's huge boss battles into an entirely new genre, inventive uses of the Wii Remote, that it'll be pretty cheap to produce since it can reuse much of the Prime Trilogy's engine, models, and animations, and the format makes multiplayer easy to develop without having to worry too much about network performance or bandwidth. In other words, online frame drops won't break a tactics game like they would in a first-person shooter. So why didn't Metroid Tactics get made? The pitch was designed and presented by Paul Tozer, a huge Metroid fan who joined Retro Studios after Metroid Prime and became one of the programmers for Prime 2 and 3. Retro was getting kind of burnt out on Metroid after the second Prime game and wanted to move on to another IP. That's when they asked Nintendo if they could make a Zelda spin-off starring Sheik. But Satoru Iwata asked them to make one more Metroid Prime to finish the trilogy, which they did. Then afterwards, Retro really wanted to move on. We heard this from several other Retro guys we spoke to. They called it franchise fatigue. But Paul was one of the team members still gung-ho on Metroid, and was ready for Prime 4, or a spin-off like Metroid Tactics. He ended up quitting the same week Retro switched to making Donkey Kong games. As far as his credentials, Paul's got design credits on three strategy games that did release, and he also helped write the design for Heroes of Hyrule, the Zelda Tactics game Retro cooked up three years earlier. We talked about that pitch a few months ago. We'll have a link in the description in case you missed that video. But while Heroes of Hyrule had several developers working on it before ultimately getting rejected by Nintendo, Metroid Tactics was just Paul, and it got rejected by Retro's higher-ups. Nintendo never saw the pitch. Paul told us, If there was a way to pitch something from inside Retro Studios that would make it all the way up the chain to Nintendo and actually get approved for production, then I never figured out what it was, and no one else at Retro did either. In order to succeed, a pitch would have to enlist the support of then-design lead Mark Pacini, studio head Michael Kelbaugh, and Nintendo producer Kensuke Tanabe. And those three individuals had wildly different tastes and perspectives on gameplay and different goals for what they wanted to see Retro Studios working on. Knowing what we know now, there's a good chance Nintendo would have rejected the pitch anyway since they started development on Metroid Other M around the same time. And it's unlikely they would have greenlit two Metroid games to release so close together on the same console. And, well, that's the story of Metroid Tactics from start to finish. A cool idea from the Metroid Prime team that just never got any traction. Sure would be cool to see an XCOM fan mod someday, though. Okay, now for the next game. In 2014, three pieces of concept art were accidentally shared online by a former artist at Next Level Games, the studio probably best known today as the developers of Luigi's Mansion 2 and 3. Most of the guys we reached out to weren't willing to talk, and pretty much everyone who would talk wanted to remain anonymous, so we're gonna have to leave out a lot of names. But essentially, a former Next Level artist posted these three pieces on his art website. One shows a stylized Samus design. Two Samuses, actually, which we'll explain here in just a minute. The second piece shows a giant boss creature. Zoom in and you can see some humans providing scale. And the last piece was another boss design, but with less work put into it. If you Google this cancelled project nowadays, you won't find much. Just this fan wiki calling it a cancelled 3DS game. And a few articles published back when the art surfaced, saying, It's unlikely we'll receive solid answers as to what exactly this art is from or what it could have been. And that, sadly, we may never know the full story. Well, after looking into it, we did get the full story. It was called Project Valkyrie, a series of prototypes built over the course of seven years, although development actually began on the Nintendo DS, not the 3DS. We talked to three former Next Level devs. One of them said, As far as we got with it, it was a pretty straightforward multiplayer deathmatch. The first version on DS was very small, I remember. The dev team was probably less than five or six people. I don't think it was anything beyond that. 
I think I was the only 3D character modeler on that project at that time. So I was the one doing all those Samus iterations and power-up icons. The goal was essentially to make an online, standalone version of the multiplayer modes found in Metroid Prime Hunters and Metroid Prime 2. Next Level worked on the DS version of Project Valkyrie for about four months. They call this DS version Phase 1 of Development, and it was pretty basic, with each player controlling a different Samus. There was an orange one, a purple one, and so on. When Samus's concept art made its way online, some fans thought the art style was pretty weird. But the modeler told us the in-game models were pretty faithful to what Samus looked like in Metroid Prime, but with far fewer polygons. The second Samus in that concept art shows some glowing panels on Samus's suit. These were added to help players see each other at a distance. And the concept art was labeled Valkyrie because that was the game's codename, Project Valkyrie. That's a reference to Norse mythology. Valkyries are feminine figures who guide the souls of the dead into the afterlife. Our anonymous modeler also made an in-game model for this boss concept. He remembers it as a legless crustacean-like creature with mantis arms and articulate mandibles. Kind of like a hydralisk from StarCraft. But it wasn't something players teamed up to beat. The bosses were more like obstacles. Killing your opponents was still the primary focus, and giant enemies running amok were there to enhance the PvP experience. As for the battlefield, Phase 1 was still early days, so they'd only built a pretty flat, basic environment. But Next Level had never made a portable game before, only home console titles, and they were having trouble getting Valkyrie off the ground. I remember the programmers had really huge trouble making it, another dev told us. Because we were used to developing on a more powerful console, it was four players, but they were super low res. They didn't look very good because it was on Nintendo DS. After about four months, Nintendo decided to pull the plug. Next Level was always careful never to say publicly that they worked on Metroid, but here's how their director, Bryce Holiday, described their project's termination a few years later. He told Kotaku, We were developing something in secret, like we usually do working with Nintendo. There was a conference call, where it was kind of announced to us that we would stop working on what we were currently doing and start, they even added a little drum roll, to work on Luigi's Mansion 2. Kensuke Tanabe is a funny guy, and he was trying to get me excited for this bad news. Someone else on the call said there was about 30 seconds of stunned silence. In hindsight, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to them. Luigi's Mansion 2 went on to shatter all expectations, selling twice as many copies as the GameCube original, and outselling the entire Metroid Prime trilogy combined. After Luigi's Mansion launched in 2013, Nintendo had Next Level start working on a few more secret projects, including a Wii U mech game. But we don't want to get sidetracked talking about other projects, so we'll keep this story centered on Metroid. Long story short, Nintendo eventually told them to cancel everything else and focus on resurrecting Project Valkyrie. The devs call this stage of development Phase 2. Now, with the team tripled in size, they were leaving the underpowered DS behind and developing console-level assets. All the original code was thrown out, but the core idea remained the same, four-player online deathmatch. The 3D modeler told us, Phase 2 was for a more Wii U-like hardware, as we were much less restricted on things like polygon count. It wasn't explicitly for the Wii U, but the prototype we were working on had none of the technical constraints of Phase 1. It wasn't clear what the original platform was yet, but it would have been vastly more powerful than the original DS, so we began in a more ambitious direction. The models for the weapons, enemies, and environments were closer to a PS3 game at that point. The battlefield was a more robust environment. I think it was like inside a space station kind of feel. There was a boss I made that was sort of a tripod inside an orb, that when you shot it enough, it would open up and change forms. It was definitely inspired by the War of the Worlds tripods. A little less organic, more mechanical, but still that whole, like, tall, walking alien thing. Players could also collect upgrades to get an advantage over their opponents, like missiles, speed boosters, teleportation power-ups, stronger lasers, and so on. There was also parts of the stage you could destroy with certain weapons, like destroying walls that had upgrades hidden behind them, strategic high ground, or shortcuts to flank your enemies, and of course, morph ball-sized tunnels to roll around in. But we should note that the 3D modeler we talked to left the company before Phase 2 was finished, so he can't confirm if tunnels or the tripod were ever implemented. But that's the direction they were headed when he walked out the door. However, not long after he left, Project Valkyrie's development took a major turn. Kensuke Tanabe, the same guy who did the drum roll and told them Phase 1 was cancelled, had actually been wanting to make a story-based game that focused on Federation soldiers since the original trilogy wrapped up. As a producer at Nintendo, he oversaw both Retro Studios and Next Level games, and with Retro now working on Donkey Kong, he saw this as an opportunity to have Next Level finally make his idea into a reality. 
He also wanted it to be a launch title for the new Nintendo 3DS, an upgraded 3DS model releasing holiday 2014. As a result, the graphics had to get scaled down dramatically to work on a handheld. We talked to another team member who stayed on till the project was finished. He said, We were told it should be a co-op game, four players, in the Metroid Prime universe. That was kind of our directive. Nintendo were quite specific that that's what they wanted. But once they told us that, we still had creative freedom in designing levels and stuff. But the overall vision of the game was four-player co-op in the Metroid universe. If you haven't figured it out already, what happened to Project Valkyrie was that it ultimately got transformed into Metroid Prime Federation Force. Instead of a fast-paced PvP deathmatch in the Metroid universe, Federation Force was a slower co-op title with an emphasis on PvE, player versus environment. In other words, up to four players teaming up to solve puzzles and fight enemies through a story-focused campaign. Despite its reputation, Federation Force really wasn't that bad. Browse through YouTube reviews nowadays and you'll see most folks who gave it a chance actually liked it for what it was, as opposed to hating it for what it wasn't. If released back when Metroid was practically an annual franchise, it probably would have gotten a similar reception as Metroid Prime Hunters and Pinball. But that wasn't the situation. After all those years without a traditional Metroid, fans were in no mood for Federation Force. Making things worse, the game ended up being delayed more than a year past the new 3DS launch window and wasn't ready until 2016. When Federation Force finally hit store shelves, it managed to sell only 150,000 copies, making it the worst-selling Metroid game of all time. It's impossible to know if Project Valkyrie would have fared any better, but it probably couldn't have done much worse. To close out the story, we talked to one more team member who told us, The prototypes were more like Quake, like a Quake game but Metroid. I think to this day I'm more in love with the early exploration than I am with the final product. And that's the story of Project Valkyrie. A seven-year development story starting on Nintendo DS, upgrading to a console-level graphics Quake-like project, then ultimately turning into Federation Force. Okay, now on to Metroid 64. But before we get to the modern-day quotes, let's dig through some old magazines to see what the devs said back in the 90s. Tons of classic Nintendo series made their transition to 3D on the Nintendo 64, but that didn't necessarily have to be the path forward for Metroid. Miyamoto still had a lot of enthusiasm for 2D games in the early 3D era, as well as excitement for what the Nintendo 64 could achieve in 2D that wasn't possible on the Super Nintendo. And he said as much over the course of several magazine interviews. He told GameFan magazine in August 2000, Before, yes, the technology allowed us to only make 2D games, but now we have the option to make 3D games as well. It's not about a transition, but rather the expansion of the alternatives we now have. As a matter of fact, I don't think the possibility of 2D has died down at all. It will just keep on going. And he told Nintendo Power in October 1996, The N64 is really an interesting and exciting machine. In some cases, 2D images created on the N64 may be more interesting than 3D graphics. We can create high quality and cool 2D graphics. As for N64 Magazine UK, he said, 3D graphics are fine, but polygons offer a kind of solid graphics. And if you like it, that's alright, but texture mapped graphics are always limited to set ways, and they will always look similar. However, when it comes to 2D graphics, there's a variety of ways in which you can paint the original pictures that are used in the game. You could use an airbrush, you could use a pencil, you could use chalk, or many other ways. You can paint the pictures in any way you like. And in Gamers Republic November 1999 issue, he stated, After working for years on developing games on N64, I don't think it's necessarily right that action games all be in 3D. Nintendo didn't end up making many 2D games for N64, but Yoshi's Story is the best example of one that did get made. It was also the best-selling example, with Miyamoto describing it as 2.5D with a cardboard art style. As far as graphics and gameplay, Metroid 64 could have been a direct sequel to Super Metroid. A great template could have been Castlevania Symphony of the Night, which released six months after the Nintendo 64 hit store shelves and spawned the genre-defining term Metroidvania, even if it was meant to have a mocking connotation at the time. There were a lot of requests for Metroid 64 in the 90s, and Miyamoto said he was passing along fan letters to the guys in charge. He was also bringing it up in high-level meetings. Gamers Republic magazine asked Miyamoto, what remaining 16-bit sequels might we see on the Nintendo 64? Miyamoto laughed and said, well, Metroid. Although, I'm not the Metroid producer, whenever I come across the opportunity in a company meeting, I try to suggest it. Miyamoto had a lot of sway, but unfortunately Metroid wasn't under his control. 
The series was under Nintendo R&D 1, who were too busy making Virtual Boy games like Mario's Tennis and Wario Land, as well as Game Boy games like Wario Land 2 and 3 and the Game & Watch Gallery games. In fact, that's pretty much the only games they were making for the five years after Super Metroid. And according to Miyamoto, that was keeping them too busy to make any N64 games. What he didn't mention was that the Metroid series' sales were declining with each new entry, which was presumably one of the reasons 8-bit Wario was taking priority over 64-bit Samus. Wario Land sequels weren't just quicker and easier to make, they sold better, too. And despite its critical acclaim, Symphony of the Night's sales were pretty lackluster. People just weren't really buying 2D games at the dawn of the 3D era. So even if Miyamoto was still a believer in 2D, financially speaking, 3D might have been the only viable option for Metroid 64. And that brings us to something of a roadblock. Super Metroid's director Yoshio Sakamoto's problems with 3D. Looking back years later, he said, I was actually thinking about the possibility of making a Metroid game for the N64, but I felt I shouldn't be the one making the game. When I held the N64 controller in my hands, I just couldn't imagine how it could be used to move Samus around. So for me, it was just too early to personally make a 3D Metroid. Using the joystick, just like any other 3D game, seems like the obvious answer, but Sakamoto has some interesting hang-ups when it comes to controllers. A decade later, he insists that Metroid Other M not use a Wii nunchuck, but instead only use the Wii remote held sideways, like an NES controller. In another interview, Sakamoto gave a few more reasons why he didn't make Metroid 64. That the story was already wrapped up at the end of Super Metroid. That it'd be difficult for his team at R&D 1 who made Game Boy games to make an N64 title, and that the console's graphical limitations would have made it difficult to achieve the realism the series was known for. Those are all pretty good reasons why R&D 1 wasn't the right team for the job. But the most interesting part of both these interviews is when Sakamoto says Nintendo asked an outside studio to make Metroid 64 for them. Essentially, the same thing Nintendo did a few years later when they outsourced Metroid Prime to Retro Studios. Except in that case, Retro accepted the offer. But for Metroid 64, the offer was refused. Quoting Sakamoto directly, he said, Nintendo at that time approached another company and asked them if they would make an N64 version of Metroid, and their response was that no, they could not. They turned it down, saying that unfortunately, they didn't have the confidence to create an N64 Metroid game that could compare favorably with Super Metroid. That's something I take as a compliment to what we achieved with Super Metroid. To us, that sounds like it might have been a polite way of declining Nintendo's offer, and maybe there was a bit more to the story. Which raises a couple of pretty big questions. Who did Nintendo ask to make Metroid 64, and what was the real reason they turned it down? Sakamoto purposely didn't say. He was asked to identify the studio, but he declined. Talking to folks in the industry, most rumors point to two Western studios. Rareware, the makers of Banjo-Kazooie and Goldeneye, and Rockstar, the makers of Lemmings and, of course, Grand Theft Auto. We set out to explore these rumors with mixed results, so let's get into it. One page of Nintendo history that's been mostly forgotten nowadays is the Ultra 64 Dream Team, about a dozen Western studios that Nintendo assembled to make exclusive third-party N64 games. Rareware was part of the Dream Team and so was DMA Design, the studio who later became Rockstar. At the time, the company's founder, David Jones, said they were, quote, "...effectively a first-party studio belonging to Nintendo." And Miyamoto himself was directly involved with the Dream Team's management, to the extent that one executive highlighted their relationship by saying, quote, "...Mr. Miyamoto came to the first meeting in San Diego. We had the honor that this mother effer came to us." We spent a few months tracking down some lower-level guys from different corners of Rockstar, and most of them said they would have loved to work on Metroid, but no, they didn't hear about an offer from Nintendo. So we talked to a couple Rockstar producers. One of them said he had heard the rumors back then, but as far as he knew, they were just rumors. We even spent an hour on the phone with Jamie King, one of the five guys who founded Rockstar Games back in 1998. He was more than just a founder, though. He worked on countless titles, including the GTA series and some games for the Nintendo 64. Jamie was very friendly and forthcoming. He'd heard the rumors, too, but again, just rumors. You can't go much higher than founders and producers. We can't rule out Rockstar with 100% certainty, but we're pretty confident they weren't the studio who turned down Metroid 64. So what about Rare? They were Nintendo's golden boy back in the 90s, and Miyamoto especially was a big fan. When he was asked what developers outside Nintendo he most admired, he didn't even have to think about it. Rare, he said. Rare makes very good games, but otherwise there are not many unusual or unique games out there at the moment, and that's what we should all be doing. 
Miyamoto expounded on that in other interviews, saying, quote, Rare's games are similar to Nintendo's, but the quality is extremely high. Rare has been able to make a Nintendo 64 games which are even better looking than our own. Rare has done a lot for the gaming industry. All of Rare's games are 3D, but they all have very different gameplay. They are encouraging us to create a different genre of games that departs from 3D adventure gaming. Miyamoto was even in one of Rare's games, Perfect Dark. So we started looking into Rare. Just like Rockstar, the lower level staff didn't know much about it. But one guy we spoke to was Martin Wakeley, the head of Rare's design team back in the 90s. He told us, I do have a vague recollection of talking about it in the old boardroom. I would have been making the decisions from the dev team perspective, and if it was offered to us, I probably would have said yes. I think the most likely thing that happened was Nintendo could have approached Rare about it, but it was at a time when Rare were keen to establish their own IP, and as a result get a higher cut of royalties, and it probably got rejected for that reason alone. I would have been the only person from the team involved in any discussions. Above me, it would have been Rare's management, Simon Farmer, or Rare's founders, the Stamper Brothers, who would have spoken to Nintendo. So, money. That sounded like a more realistic reason an outside studio would have passed on Nintendo's offer. It took another year to get a hold of Simon Farmer. He's a very private person, and from what we've gathered, he's retired on a beach somewhere. We thought we were getting close to solving the mystery, but unfortunately he told us, There's no Metroid dirt, so you're barking up the wrong tree. Have a mojito for me. We're friendly with former Rare producer Kevin Bayliss, and he backed up Simon's comments, saying, Yeah, just a rumor. I used to spend a lot of time with Simon, so it sounded odd. If he'd have known, I'd have known. That means, if it was Rare, the only people who knew were the Stamper brothers. But they're infamous for almost never granting interviews, and unfortunately, we couldn't get them. For good measure, we also talked to some guys from Retro Studios, including Metroid Prime's original director, John Whitmore. He said Retro wasn't offered Metroid 64 and didn't think Rare did any work on it either. I think if Rare had done it, we would know about it. We also got in touch with Perrin Kaplan, a former Nintendo of America executive. In a 1997 magazine, she said she'd heard Metroid 64 was in development. But when we talked to her, she couldn't remember what she'd heard all those years ago, and neither could her business partner. We also spoke to a few other studios, but it was all wild goose chases and dead ends. So unfortunately, after two years of digging, we couldn't get a definitive answer on who turned down Metroid 64. As huge Metroid fans, we really want to fill this hole in the story. We've gotten kind of obsessed after all this time. So, we're putting out a bounty. Somewhere out there, there's some developers who knows the name of that studio, and we'll pay a thousand bucks to hear their side of the story. Our Twitter DMs are open. Message us anytime, and we'd be happy to keep your identity a secret. And also, here's some fine print so the terms of the bounty are clear and upfront. If we ever get the story, we'll share it in a future video. Did you also know Retro wanted to add actual bounty hunting missions into Prime 3, but Nintendo said no? If you want to hear the full story, click the video on screen. Or, if you're more interested in a playable Metroid gamebook only released in Japan, click the other video. There's more videos like this one coming up, so subscribe if you don't want to miss them. Big thanks to all the devs who were willing to talk to us, our translators, and everyone who made this video possible. My name is Vinny, and I wouldn't recommend watching Vine Sauce on Twitch or YouTube. It's just not worth it.